This audio fiction may contain elements not suitable for children. Listener discretion is advised. Nikin still carries the young woman as he and his companions move through the thick, verdant forest. Given the woman has refused to talk to or speak with them at length, they have been guessing at where to go. She shows no signs of divulging any information. I don't suppose you want to talk yet. No, I'm not telling you anything. All right then, this slow stroll into the unknown continues. She is in danger too if we encounter anything she doesn't tell us about. So I wouldn't worry about it. That is a good point. Why was she in the trees though? We know Nikon was spying on the others who landed on this island. He was, so it stands to reason that she was spying on us. Or the others. That's probable. Think bigger picture. What bigger picture? They were spying on people who landed on the shores. That means they have reason to be suspicious of visitors. Kinatari folds her arms. She averts her gaze. Great tidings for you. We are not raiders looking for treasure. Yes, because I haven't heard that before. I heard a rumor that magic has returned to the world and that this island is its advent. You believe in magic's existence? But of course, magic is in recorded history. Are you, is he serious? All of us believe magic exists. Including my and Nikon's parents, who told us about the magic our ancestors used. There are too many stories to outright dismiss it. For a bunch of sea dwellers, I suppose it shouldn't be a complete surprise. Uh, what does that mean? Setis watches the group from his hiding spot among the branches. He moves agilely above the group. When he can draw close to them with sufficient cover, he listens in on the conversation. The last topic of discussion catches him off guard. They what? Put off by the sudden change of topic, Seti stops moving. They believe magic exists? Who are these people? When he realizes the group has gotten ahead of him, Seti moves to catch them once more. Several hours later, Nikin stops short of a crevice. The sea-dwelling man looks down at the bloody scene with incredulity. This way is not our best course of action. Serves them right. Why? We don't need visitors. They were here to take our resources and kill us if we didn't let them. Alejandro, Ishai, and Malia approach the pit. This explains why she was moving through the trees. It does, yes. They may not have intentionally been here to pilfer your resources. How would you know? There's fruit scattered around them. They were probably here to gather food. No matter. It's not as if we can do anything about them. Well, they may present a bigger problem for our injured friend here. Meaning what? The way it works with a ship is you never send all your crew onto shore. You need somebody on board to protect the ship and keep it from being stolen. So? When these men don't return to the ship, more men are going to wander onto the island to find them. And there being a pit with skewers is a clue somebody lives here and has something to protect. Oh no. Not more of you. <laughs> so, which way gets you home to warn your people? Kinatari looks at the canopy above her. To her disappointment, none of her friends were visible through the leaves and vines. You seem worried about Kinatari. Aren't you? If she survived her fall, then everything should be fine. But she's with these strangers. We know nothing about them. They'll end up in one of our traps soon enough. Like the others did. Do you want us to return and find her? No. Give it until nightfall. If she is still with them then, it will be easier to evade them after dark. Zui and Tichlina bow, then leave Emon's company. Satis is the only one watching over her now, though. Yes, but we should use the darkness as a cover to bring her back to the village. 
We need to rest too. But we shouldn't leave Setis out there alone, yes? We should send somebody to relieve him, yes. Let's go. The pair make their way across the right bridge. So, what do we do if they make their way into the village? In the past, only those attuned to magic could get into our village. But they have our friend with them. With how magic works, they may only have to be around her to get here. Remember that the past visitors only got to any of us when we were outside the village. Yes, but... <sighs> it's not an absolute, right? Calm down. We need to find a small troop to relieve Setis, and then tonight, we will rescue Kinatari. What if they hurt Kinatari? Then Setis and Kinatari will fight them. How can you be so calm? For starters, the one we had a close call with, he didn't hurt the animals. Secondly, I am not worried about a small group of visitors that knows nothing about our home. Lastly, if they get close to the village, then I'll panic. Oh, to have your confidence. <sighs> Nikin gently places the islander on the ground. Giving up? Nope. Karen, you is tiring, and I haven't eaten since sunrise. Alejandro, Malia, and Ishai gather various fruits from the nearby trees and bushes. Kinatari stares off thoughtfully. When Nikin comes into her line of sight, she shakes herself from her reverie. What are you doing? Looking for food. Didn't you bring food? Yes, but it would be foolish to eat everything of ours when we can eat food that grows here. You're not worried about eating something poisonous? Not in the slightest. Nikin picks up a round fruit from the ground. He looks up at the trees, then he offers the fruit to a nearby monkey. Nikin watches as the small animal gleefully eats the food. I've done that with every food item we've considered eating. Judging from the monkey's enthusiasm with eating it, I assume it's safe. Who thinks to do that? Why are you concerned about what we're eating? Nikin begins collecting the round fruit from nearby branches. I'm not. If I don't tell them about it, then nothing will happen. Well, you're not to worry. We'll get you safely home soon enough. Ugh. Right. Traps to keep people away from you is smart, though. I'll grant you that. They couldn't have had enough to get there. They've only been here a few days. Nikan settles down beside Kinatari. He offers her a fruit. She accepts it, then glares at the ground. Sorry you fell, though. Seems like it hurt. I'll recover. I get why you didn't want us anywhere near your home. But I assure you, we mean you and your home no harm. The pair partake in the fruit for several moments. When he finishes eating, Nikin looks at the young woman. You realize we may be out overnight, only reaching your home in the morning? Don't worry about it too much. At sundown, when the scouts did not return with samples of food found on the island, those still on the ship become concerned. The four first light. We set out the search for them. Are you certain? Of course. Why wouldn't we assume they're simply lost? How many shall we take? I am eager to go. I would say only a small group. And I intend to go. Of course. As you wish. But who would we leave in charge of the ship? That doesn't matter to me. We are looking for a group that has been lost. They know to stay on the ship and not to leave under any circumstances. Perhaps we should go now. Leave now? Right before nightfall. Does that seem smart to you? If they are injured or trapped, they may only have a short time to live. Hmm. He does bring up a good counterpoint. We may be risking their lives if we wait until sunrise to set out. So you want us all to go now? On a hypothetical. They knew they were supposed to mark their paths. Then return to the ship long before sundown. That is reason enough to suspect that things were poorly for them. There is no telling what sort of beasts lie in wait. Ugh, or sea dwellers. 
Now, oh, now. There's no proof any of them are here. The island is new. It's probably not inhabited by anything. Then what's keeping them? I hope simply being careless and lost. But we'll find out soon enough. Prepare two water skins. Small bag with food rations. Uh, and material to make a fire and weapon. I have no idea what we'll find out there. Under the cover of darkness, the land-dwelling explorers move through the expansive thicket. With torches in hand, the group moves at a steady pace. They look for signs of their companions and the path they may have taken. After many hours in the jungle, Arbia and her small group happen upon a group sleeping among the brush. I wonder who they are. That's not important. We need to see if our crew is among them. Nothing more. Shall we wake them and see if they've seen our men? We know nothing about them. It's safer to avoid them if possible. All right. We avoid waking them. All but Arbia approach those sleeping on the jungle floor. With the crackling flames on torches as light, the three look down at the strangers. In the tree's blanket of leaves, the well-rested island natives wait for assurance the small party below them is asleep. They need the strangers to sleep so they may bring their friend to the village without the strangers following. Did you hear that? No, what is it? Voices. Are they still awake? Four strangers approach the sleeping group. They are barely visible through the thick foliage. This has just become more complicated. What do we do? We wait and see what they mean to do. They're sea dwellers. Really? That's odd. Really? That's odd. Let's not wake them, even if we find nothing of our men. Agreed. That may prove dangerous given what they are. This one isn't a sea dweller. Why would they have a land dweller with them? I wouldn't call her a land dweller either. Abia approaches the sleeping woman. She and Faris stare down at the young woman. The young woman has a physiology like neither of them has seen before then. Sea dwellers have elongated notched ears and a large physical build. Land dwellers have short rounded ears and slight builds. This woman has slim elongated pointed ears and a lean build. On one arm is a white marking. What is she? Oh. I have no idea. She looks like both. Faris crouches down beside the woman. He runs his fingertip over the marking on the strange-looking woman's arm. When the marking does not smudge, he tilts his head. That mark is permanent. Huh. That's fascinating. Zwee watches the strange man. He reaches the end of his patience, then he descends. Zwee, Zwee, wait! There are too many of them! We need to get down there. Zwi grasps a vine and uses it to slide out of the canopy toward the ground. Tichlina and Setis hurry after their friend. Faris jumps in surprise after a stranger lands beside him. Faris holds his torch toward the stranger. He notices a similar white mark near the man's left eye. Back away from her. Uh, what do we do, Captain? We mean your friend no harm. We are merely looking for our companion. So back away from her, then turn and leave this place. The sounds of the voices in the area wake the sea dwellers and the lone sleeping island inhabitant. Uh, Zui, why are you here? We came to bring you home. <laughs> that explains who you are. Nikin pushes himself upright. But who are the rest of you? We came from our ship to find our other companions. They were gathering some food for the others on board. They did not return home, so we were worried for their safety. We have seen nobody but you before now, so you're looking in the wrong place. Tichlina lands on the ground beside Zui. Zui crouches beside Kinatari. 
We need to get you out of here. Why haven't you gotten up? I'm still in pain from my fall. I can carry you then. All right. Thank you. You need to leave. There is nothing here for outsiders. We were lost during a storm. We were not intended to stay here, but our food supply was lost overboard. We needed something or our crew was going to starve. You heard her. Leave. And why are you an exception to a warning? Because I am not here pillaging resources from them. <laughs> you are not an exception to anything, sea-dwelling trash. <laughs> you think insults are intimidating. Tamar produces a pistol. He points it toward Nikin. The other land dwellers do the same. This has been enough scouting for my taste. We should take them all with us, no? Look at those three. We don't even know what they are. They will fetch a fair price with that alone. There are plenty of land dwellers looking for servants regardless of if they're from the sea or not. Excuse me? They're slavers. What's that? They capture people and use them as goods for sale, the same as you might food or clothing. Tichlina's stance changes. You will never take us alive, you monstrous trespassers. I'll try not to gravely injure them. Yes. Fire. But keep them alive if you can. Bodies do not go for the same prices. Living, Pogo. He shy steps forward. You are the most deplorable people I have ever met. As Ishai speaks, the slavers are knocked off balance. The three natives near her stare in incredulity. After witnessing one of the visitors using magic, Setis moves out of the tree he's occupying. He lets himself down in the nearby brush. What? What was that? An earthquake? They have had enough exposure. She knocked them away? Apparently so. What? What was that? It was magic. You think that was magic? What did Dad always tell us about Mother's temperamental nature and magic? That if magic returns... <gasps> Channel your anger at them. Nikin and Ashai step forward. The siblings did as they were told. They let their disgust with the slavers whelm in them. Around the slavers, the ground shakes. Bushes become uprooted, and winds kick up sporadically. Don't just stand there! Run! The four slavers hurry down the nearby path. They are met by another island native. Setis holds up his palm toward them. The four slavers are immediately immolated. What is happening? What was that fire? What, what is all of this? I have no idea, Ali. This is not how I expected any of this to go. Magic has returned! Magic has returned to the world! And we used it! While the siblings celebrate triumphantly, the group is joined by Setis. No worries, I killed those four. Now, why haven't you done the same with them? 